Well, good evening, friends. We're just so glad that you've joined us for Bible study tonight. If you've ever wondered how to live a long, successful, happy life, maybe Harvard Research has uh, got part of the answer for you. It is surprising to find, the report says, that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships that has a powerful influence on our health and happiness, said Robert Waldinger, a psychiatrist and professor at Harvard Medical School. The ongoing Harvard study is considered one of the world's longest studies of adult life, having started back in 1938 during the Great Depression. Dr. Waldinger said, our study has shown that people who fared best in happiness were people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, and with community. So Harvard has confirmed exactly what we've been studying in our Habits of Happiness series, that happiness is actually a byproduct, first of all, of good and healthy relationships. May I direct your attention back once more to the book of Proverbs today. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 15. Here's what it says. For the despondent every day brings trouble. For the happy heart, life is a continual feast. Life is a continual feast for the happy heart. I love the way that the Amplified Bible trades off and adds to that particular verse this way. All the days of the desponding and afflicted are made evil by anxious thoughts and forebodings. I trust that's not you. But he who has a glad heart has a continual feast regardless of circumstances. So if the Harvard study is true, then probably what we need to do is get back to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. We'll look again at the verses 3 to 8 tonight and wrap up this segment of our study of the habits of happiness by, wrapping, by giving you the last two habits for healthy relationships. And then next week, we'll move on to something fresh in the book of Philippians. But let's go there, would you? Philippians chapter 1, verses 3, down to the end of verse 8. Here's what it says. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you as every in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day... Of Christ Jesus. It is right for me, Paul continues in verse 7, to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in the grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and establishment of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Let's pray together and get started. Father, Direct our minds and hearts tonight, we pray, as we contend with these last two habits, as we look at the conclusion of growing healthy relationships, we ask that you would enlighten our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the habits of happiness, and we are in the third lesson that we've put together on growing healthy relationships as the first response to getting the happiness that most people are actively seeking in their lives. We learned in the very first lesson that happiness is not something we should seek after, after but is rather a byproduct of good relationships and a solid walk with God and with others. So, with that in mind, we're going to conclude this first little segment that had four parts to it, and we'll do the last two tonight on growing healthy relationships. Let's go to the third one of those traits. To grow healthy relationships, thirdly, I must expect the best from the people in my life. Paul says that's the third habit. I expect the best 
from the people in my life. And these things are so simple, as I said at the beginning, but they're often difficult to turn into habits because we don't normally expect the best from people around us. Isn't that true? In fact, the people that we know the best, we expect to let us down because we know them the best and they have a track record. Isn't that true? But Paul is reminding us here in Philippians chapter 1 that the habit of believing in people rather than criticizing them is critical to our happiness. Expect the best, he said, especially in the context he's speaking of believers. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 is where you'll find that. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Circle that word in your Bible, confident, being confident of this. I'm expecting the best from and for the people in my life, especially Christian people. I'm expecting that out of the relationships that I form, especially those in the circle of faith, that as we walk and work and pray and study together, I'm confident that I'm going to see God at work transforming and transitioning people from the hopeless habits of their past into the glorious people that God has always aspired for them to be. And Paul said, you got to bring out the best in people for them to be the best. So Paul, how do I do that? Well, Paul illustrates that for you, and I'm going to show you, or at least I'm going to do my very best to show you, how he does that three different ways in verse 6. Number one, the first way that Paul says, and this is your homework, by the way, for point number three, the first way to grow this healthy relationship is I must believe in people and tell them. I must believe in people and tell them, because that's what Paul did. He believed, and he told them, I am confident, he said, of this. Now, do people, do do you give people in your life confidence, or do they expect a verbal beating when you come around? Are they expecting to be encouraged? Are they expecting you to lift them up, to help them along the journey? Or are they expecting something else, perhaps, from you? Well, sometimes people say, Jim, I just have to tell you that I just tell it like it is. Okay? You can tell it like it is. But here's what I know. That often doesn't change anybody. I could get up here and say, you're all failing at life. And it's true. Most of us have some area in our lives that is not doing well, nobody has to tell me that I'm not living up to my full God-given potential. And I could tell you area, areas, I'm sure, if we sat down and had a conversation for long enough, where you are falling short of the glory of God as well. But what good would it do if that was all that I said? I'd just make you defensive and Maybe you wouldn't change one little bit. And next week, instead of coming back to chat with me or to have a conversation or a coffee together, you'd say to your wife or whoever you were traveling with, let's go find somebody else to talk to. Well, so don't just tell it like it is. Do this instead. Tell it like it could be. I must believe in people and tell them. Tell them what could be. Tell them the truth about what God is wanting and willing to do in their lives, especially if they're in Christ, because Christians happen to have additional power and resources for change and transformation because of the presence of the Holy Spirit at work within them. But everybody can be different. You don't have to be a Christian to change. I've known lots of people that are outside the circle of faith who have made some rather huge changes in their lives, all for the good, all for the best. And they've struggled to do it, but they've made it. And uh, 
They can't get as far as God might take them. They can't make all the transitions, perhaps, that the Spirit of God would empower them to make. But that doesn't mean that they can't change for the better. And this is what I can see developing in people. I need to see what's developing in them, rather. Their gifts, their talents, their abilities. If they're Christians, potentially they can go farther as they yield to the life-transforming power of the Spirit. But if I'm positive and affirming with them, anyone can change. So don't just tell it like it is. Tell it like it could be. You see, when I express confidence in people, they get excited. Paul says to the Christians at Philippi, I'm confident. I believe that God is at work in you. The second thing he did then was that he was his confidence gave them vision. That vision is what's growing now in character inside of them. So not only was he believing in them and telling them, but I must help them see a vision of the future. Now, flattery is a form of lying, Proverbs says, and wounds cruelly. Flattery will do no one any good. That is a form of hatred, the Bible says, and wounds people. So don't flatter them. Be truthful with them. Be honest with them. But the vision that what is growing now in character and ability can get you to another level of excellence, that's something that you can talk to people about because everyone can grow. God has given everybody talents, abilities, skills can be honed for the good. Everyone has the possibility of developing good character qualities and maintaining a measure of integrity. All this stuff is attainable and achievable. Now, our sinfulness, our brokenness limit us severely. They'll break in and break up something good that's going, going on. But when you look around at humanity and what we have been able to accomplish in the mercy of God, we've done some pretty amazing stuff. And so... To give people a vision of the future is a good thing. Now, when we speak about followers of Jesus, this takes on whole new dimensions because what God starts in people, here's what I know about God. He not only starts something, he finishes what he starts. Isn't that what Paul said? Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. When I'm talking to a Christian, I can tell them, from the scriptures, what's at the end of this road? Because the Bible outlines in story and in illustration and sometimes in flat out plain text where the future lies and the good that God is willing to pour into the lives of those who can be transformed and yield or surrender to his power and his inner working. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29 says to believers, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's why I'm talking about believers here, friends. He, for those God foreknew, those God knew in advance, would be committing themselves to Christ, to his cause, to his plans and his purposes. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. He gave them a destiny. And what was their destiny? What was his aspiration for them? He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He planned to use the circumstances, the situations, the skills, the talents, the abilities, the opportunities that were going to come their way to conform them to the image of Christ. Friends, everything God does is good. Every good and perfect gift, James says, comes down from the Father of heavenly lights, in whom is no shadow of turning. God doesn't turn to the left or the right. When God does it, it's just plain flat out good. Now, what we do with it, and how we receive it, and how we choose to respond to the good that God does, that's a totally 
other matter. But here's the confidence we have from God is this, what he begins in our family members, in our friends, especially those in Christ, he will finish. They can, they will accomplish the purpose and the plans of God if they will remain open and yielded to him. So Paul can confidently give his Christian brothers and sisters vision for the future. He has painted for them a picture of Jesus Christ as Lord of all. And he has told them that here's what God wants to do with ordinary you. He wants to transform you into the image of Jesus. So in that framework, all things can work together for the good. God can use it to knock off the rough spots and to clear a new pathway to create a new line of thought to give you and I fresh perspective. In the midst of this pandemic, God is doing things that can't be done any other way than allowing us to go through this season together. So let's learn all we can because I don't want a repeat. I don't need another lap around Jericho. How about you? I'm not anxious to try this a second time. I want these laps around the walls of Jericho, as it were, to be the last time I go around Jericho. Jericho. I want the walls to come down. I want this finished. But for that to be true, I must yield to the Spirit of God and allow Him to use His ability, His influence, and His power in my life to transform my mind and my heart and my patterns of life so that he can continue the work after this is all over. So, here's what I know. Why is all this important? Because study after study shows that we tend to live up to the expectations of other people. That's why we paint the vision for them. Paul says, I'm confident. I'm confident that something good is happening to you. I'm confident something that good is happening to you and in you. And I can tell you about the future, where that will take you. And he would paint for them a solid future. And study after study shows that we tend to live up to the expectations that other people have for us. Many of you, like I have, have had teachers. I've got enough wallpaper to cover a few walls uh, from some of the education stuff that I've done. But the best of those teachers encouraged me to push harder, to go farther. And you know what? In many cases, I was able to go farther and do more than I thought I was able to do because I had set the bar of my limitations and they could see that I could go farther and do more. And God knows what he's designed you to do. He's, he knows where you can go farther and do more. And he knows that he is going to create in you an image of Jesus Christ. He is going to shape you to be just like Jesus. And here's what I know. When teachers expect the best of their students, the students perform better than otherwise. It's been proven again and again. Now, that doesn't mean you and I don't occasionally need a reality check. But that's not all we need. We need not only a reality check to tell us where we are, we need a positive vision of the future. Because we tend to become what we believe the most important people in our lives think about us. So we observe that Paul expects the best from the people of Philippi. Number three. Number three. Here's your third piece of homework. Are you ready? Paul believed in people and told them. Number two, he gave them a vision of where this could go. And number three, Paul was patient with them because he understood the nature of progress in their lives. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work will carry it on. What's he telling me in that phrase? He's telling me, this is a process. This is not an instantaneous over the overnight spin around. This is a process that you and I are engaged in. 
Therefore, he was patient with people's progress. He understood this was going to take time. Why is that so important for happiness? I'll tell you why. Because if you and I always insist on quick or instant perfection in others or even ourselves, we're going to be miserable the rest of our lives. Friends, nobody's perfect. Not you and especially not me, because I know me. And if you're always expecting perfection from your children, from the grandkids, from an employee, a total turnaround by tomorrow because you taught them something wonderful at, wonderful today, think again. My, my old boss used to said, retrain after coffee break. In other words, he'd get me to a point, we'd take a break, and then I'd lose half of it and he would have to retrain after coffee break. And Paul says, I must be patient with people's progress. And if we're always expecting perfection, we're going to be disappointed. And frankly, so will they. So let's give them encouragement. Let's give them accolades when they're moving forward not just because they've finished the course. Let me give you a thought to consider. Maybe consider this the next time you're getting ready to take a strip off somebody. Why don't you do this? To grow healthy relationships with your staff, with your spouse, with your children, or whoever. Celebrate how far they've come rather than criticizing them for how far they still have to go. I've had people come into our assembly and look at others with their rather visible flaws and say to me, boy, he's got a long way to go. And I look at them and smile and sometimes I respond, friend, you don't know how far they've come. And for some people, it's easy to pick out the flaws and the failings. But if you've gotten to know that person and known them from day one when they gave their life to Christ and made that turnaround and you have seen and tracked the progress in their lives, you stand back and shake your head in amazement while others shake their heads in disappointment. Because you can see how far they've come. You see, here's something to think about. When my kids were smaller, they would draw, draw me great pieces of art and bring it to me and say, Dad, look at this. And I would say, Catherine, this is absolutely marvelous. Laurel, that is perfect. What is it? Susanna, that's beautiful. It looks great. And when I say that's perfect, does it mean it's a Picasso? Heavens, no. It was perfect for the stage of life that they were at. I don't expect a five-year-old to paint like Leonardo da Vinci. In fact, five-year-old da Vinci didn't paint like Leonardo da Vinci in all the books that I looked at, I'm pretty sure. Because there is a learning process involved in this. And Paul says, not only do I need to believe in people and tell them, and give them great vision, but I must be patient as they progress through the process. There is a process at work here, and you're never going to be happy, and neither am I, if we're constantly demanding perfection of ourselves and others. Paul says, I am patient with people's progress. You see, here's what I know. God doesn't wait until I'm perfect to start loving me and telling me good things about the way that he's at work in my life and the way that I'm succeeding as I yield to his grace. Here's what I know. God has loved me from the beginning and he is loving me through this process and God willing, I am making progress. And so with all the people in your life too, there must be progress and we must be patient because 
God didn't love me from the be- has loved me from the beginning. He didn't withhold his love and affection until I got it. He encouraged me with his love all the way along. And that leads me to the final big habit. The final big habit this morning, or it's not morning, well, it's not morning right now, anyways, I'll tell you that, (laughs) is this. I must love the people in my life like Jesus loves me. I think that's a great summary statement for a fourth one. So what's the key to patience in this progress and process thing? Paul says it best, I think, in the next verse, verse 7. He says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, not, all the, not only all the positive stuff that's going on. Since I have you, he said, in my heart. Look at that. I have you in my heart. And you need to circle that. You need to write that down somewhere. I have you in my heart. Why? You know what I've discovered? I've discovered if people are on, on my heart, they're on my nerves. <laughs> they're on my nerves. But I find that when the people in my life are part of my active prayer life, that I have a different perspective on them and their progress. I have to get them off my nerves and into my heart. And how do you do that? Prayer, friends. Prayer. How do you think Jesus managed it with the 12 disciples who fumbled and stumbled and thought it and forgot it and couldn't recall it when it was time. How do you think he did that? Oh, he got frustrated. If you go back and read the Gospels, you'll read the times he got really frustrated with the disciples. But every morning, the Bible says, he got out of town. He left wherever the rest of them were, got off on his own, and had communication with his heavenly Father. And by the time he got back into Peter's personal space, he was ready to deal with Peter. He was ready to see the small steps of progress and give Peter accolades. He was ready to slap him on the back and walk another few miles, get in the boat and do some more miracles and demonstrate the power and the grace of God so that Peter and 12 men could figure it out and follow him. So many of the relationship problems that you and I have over and over again are because we tend, especially, well, I think especially myself as a, as a man anyways, I tend to react with my head and not with my heart. And I, when I'm not careful, my hard-nosed logic without love or without patience is building a wall and not building a bridge. And I've had, I've had to bust down a few walls in some relationships. And I wasn't always happy, but I knew who built the wall. I did. Oh, sure, they should have known better. They should have understood. Should they? Did they really? Perhaps I should have understood. Perhaps I should have been more careful. When people say to me, you just don't understand, They're not always talking about my mental aptitude. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm not the dullest tool in the shed either. I'm a pretty intelligent character most of the time. That's my opinion. But what they're really telling me is, when they say to me, you don't understand, they're saying, you don't feel my pain. You don't grasp or identify all the factors that are playing into this, that are making this circumstance, this situation, into something that is so much more than it seems to be. You don't understand what I'm feeling. And it has nothing to do with bottom lines and reasonableness. It has to do with empathy. When they say, I don't understand, and I try and reason it out and be reasonable about that, tell them to be reasonable about this, usually... <laughs> I end up in trouble and somebody walks out the door and it slams behind them. It's not really always the best method because it's not about logic. Sometimes it is about emotion and feelings. And feelings, friends, 
are just feelings. They're not right or wrong. It's just what you're feeling. They're not reliable as a source of direction, but it is what's happening on the inside of the individual, including you. And so they are individuals and their reactions and responses to what's happening in them, through them, around them, or to them is uniquely theirs because they are unique individuals. So when Paul says, I have you in my heart, here's what I'm understanding. That loving from the heart begins with understanding and compassion. It means that you got down on your knees and spent some time before the Lord on their behalf. And out of that, somehow, don't ask me how, you start to grasp a little bit of what makes them tick. You begin to understand how they tick, and you don't judge them for ticking that way. Friends, everybody learns at a different speed. Some lessons and some levels are achieved more easily than others. Things that came easily to you may not come easily to me. Lessons you learned in life, I appreciate you telling me them. But do you remember how long it took you to figure that out? I know you can summarize it for me and try and give me a shortcut. But sometimes it takes time for me to process what's taken you years to figure out. Friends, here's what I've learned. And I'm not always proud that of the way that I had to learn it. But what I'm told is that first I need to listen. I've started to try and acknowledge feelings as theirs and not necessarily mine. And accept that that's just where they are right now. Now, I may not wish to leave them there. And that may not always be my decision to make either. And likely they don't really want to stay there either. But what you and I have to decide when we walk in on friends and family and we're encouraging them at life is with wisdom from above to love them and learn when to love. I noticed that Jesus sometimes responded to life, if you'll go back and read the stories of Jesus again, in a rather unexpected manner. He caught people off guard because he actually did understand what was going on at the moment. And so love is, I know, I understand now, does not overwhelm people with its wisdom or its intelligence, but appropriately influences and encourages others for a better tomorrow in the plans and the purposes of God. Because people are in a process and they need to progress and they need to know that there is an end in sight and that it's good, especially if it's God. They need to know that you believe that they can do this, not because they're great, but especially if they're Christians, because their God is great and he who began a good work will complete it. Jesus' command and call to all of us who claim to be his followers was this, John chapter 13, verse 34. He wiped out the old commandments. Some call them the great commandment. The great commandment is an Old Testament idea. It's certainly valid, and it's certainly true in its standing. But it's not the way Jesus wants us to respond. How do I know? Because he gave me a new commandment. And here's what it says, John 13 34 and 35, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Here's the change. The Old Testament said in the book of Numbers way back with Moses, love one another. But Jesus says in the same way that I have loved you. He understood that the way we perceive love and the way that we offer love is often skewed and somewhat twisted by our experience and our limitations. 
And so he spun it around and said, let me repeat what I told you before, love one another. In the old way, he said, love somebody else the way that you love yourself. Well, that didn't work. Well, how do you know? Well, he wouldn't have changed it if it did. He changed it to this. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciple, that you love one another. And so Jesus calls us to be like him. So we'll have to be sensitive to him and his ways and his spirit so that our reactions, our responses become an accurate reflection of his own. And that's how he's changing me. And that's how he's influencing me. And that's how the Holy Spirit is trying to work in me, is to transform me into the person that God always intended me to be. He wants me to take on the family resemblance. When we read earlier in Romans chapter 8, verse 25 and 26, the verse, said, the verse went on to say, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Why? Because he would be the first of many who would be like him and bear the family resemblance. So if I want to be happy, I start with growing healthy relationships. And there are four big picture habits that I have to adopt. And we've hashed through them all now. But let me give them to you one last time before we move on next week. The first thing that I know, to, if I'm going to experience the byproduct of happiness, is this. I must be thankful for the people in my life. The second thing I learned is that I must learn to pray for the people in my life with joy. We talked about that for quite a while. Thirdly, we learned tonight, I must expect the best from the people in my life. Because if God's at work in them, good things can be coming anytime. And fourthly, I must love people in my life like Jesus loves me. Love one another as I, he said, have loved you. How has God loved you? Has he been patient and kind and encouraging and allowed you to walk through some trials and some tribulations? And then he promises he won't leave us or forsake us, that he'll be there and he'll help us through. That's the Jesus that I know. That's the Jesus that I serve. That's the Jesus that I want to convey, whose life experience I want to reflect through mine. Because again, my natural dependency, my natural tendency rather, is to be self-centered. I tend to look at my own needs and all the things that have happened in my own life. But if I would be careful and consistent and model my actions and my responses after Jesus and hear Paul's illustration in these first 11 verses, then I think that you and I can diminish the number of relational issues that we have because we're not thinking of ourselves first. We'd be like Jesus, focusing and thinking about others. Why don't we pray tonight as we close and ask God to help us adopt these attitudes to make them habits in our own lives. Here's what I know. Desire will get me started, but only a habit will keep me going. Let's pray together, shall we? Dear God, I really do want to experience happiness, and I ask you to give me the power to be grateful for the people in my life. Help me to, to remember the best and forget the rest. In those challenging relationships, God, help me to start praying for them with joy as Paul taught me. Dear God, I ask you to help me to develop the habit of expecting the best of people in my life, especially those who are under the influence of your Holy Spirit. 
Help me to be confident and to build confidence in others. Help me to recognize how, people, how far people have come, not just how far they still have to go. Help me to affirm the work of Christ in others, even if it's just in calling them to himself in salvation. Help me to love people in my life like you love me. Spirit of God, I aspire to share with others the grace and the goodness and the love that you have shared with me. Teach me your way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust you were able to pray that with me. We're going to be journeying forward in the habits of happiness. I'll see you next week on midweek sometime. And uh, looking forward to sharing the next series of thoughts with you then. God bless you. Have a great day.